So the last character we meet, the last major character we meet in the book of Genesis is Joseph. And this story is different from anything we've had before. Uh, dealing with the other patriarchs, you have cult legends, you have character stories, whatever, but they're short, episodic stories. You could well imagine that these originated as folklore mm. and then got shaped in different ways as they were passed along. In the case of the Joseph story, we have what's often called a novella. Uh, to get good parallels to this in the Bible, you come down to stories like Esther and the stories in the book of Daniel later on. It's the Jew at the court of the foreign king, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, how does this story get in here? Yeah, it's, it, it certainly is different in kind. It's, it's just much longer. Uh, it, there are scenes, but it's not episodes, right? All the scenes contribute, none of them can, can stand alone. Uh, so novella is a reasonable word, it leads to the suspicion that the story has a literary origin as opposed to necessarily an, or an oral one. But the question of what it's doing here, uh, I think is fascinating because, you know, when, by the end of Jacob's life, even before the Joseph story starts, you have the 12 tribes of Israel, right? We've, we've hit to a certain extent, the fulfillment of the promise of progeny. Yeah, um, good place to end. Right, and when we pick up in Exodus, it picks up with the death of those 12 tribes. The difference is, we've moved somewhat geographically. You got to get them down to Egypt. Got to get them to Egypt. How did, the, how did all of the Israelites, which sounds like a lot, but is in fact only 70 people counting wives and children. Essentially, how did these 12, these 12 people, these 12 tribes, end up in Egypt? There's got to be a simpler way to answer that question than the Joseph story. Right? There must have been, an, you know, you can think of any number of ways. And in fact, the story starts quite easily, right? There's a famine. Right? There's a famine in the Joseph story. And so the brothers go down. And actually, you know, they could have just said that. They could and have just said that, And it would have gotten them right? to Egypt. Yeah. Right? And, then, and then they would have been fine. fine. Now, as you well know, there is a whole school of scholarship nowadays who say that the main difference in the Pentateuch is between Genesis and the Moses story. Mm -hmm. And that these are two alternative accounts of the origin of Israel. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, that's surely true. I mean, yes. that these, uh, we read them as consecutive to each other, but they're really two different kinds of stories yeah. and probably really are alternative explanations yeah, two, for two the Two different people. notions. Did Israel come, did Israel emerge from within Israel, right? Yeah. Are they, were they always there? Is the promise yeah. of, of land the, uh, you know, this land is yours and it stayed that way? Or do, were the Israelites somehow brought from outside, right, the notion of conquest rather than yeah. native possession? And I think, that I, I agree that there's, these, these were probably two distinctive traditions at some point. No, but the moment you try to put them together, right, there's, again, this is sort of like fictive kinship on a narrative scale, right? The moment that the people who thought that it was uh, yeah. native possession and the people who thought it was external conquest got together and said, well, it's got to be one story because we're one people. Now they just had a basic logical problem. Okay, so how did, yeah. how did it happen that we were promised it back then and then we ended up in, in Egypt? And the Joseph story structurally fills that, fills fills that, that gap. gap. Now, as you're also well aware, you will find scholars, especially in Europe, who would say that all of this happened quite late that this Joseph story is more like stories that you get in the later part of the Hebrew Bible. And this may not have happened before the Babylonian exile, that you have these different traditions taken and combined. Mm -hmm. Is there any problem with that? The real problem is you know, we have so many authors, not just the ones in the, in the Pentateuch, but ones mm -hmm. in the prophets also that are, quite, that are earlier who understand that there was, there are Exodus yeah. traditions and there yeah. are patriarchal traditions and the order in which those two things happen. Yeah. So I yeah. think that that's a fairly good, uh, that's, that's one fairly good avenue. Yeah, no, I mean, the other issue is, uh, you know, if you were to think of this as a story composed late to put the two blocks of tradition together, it ought to be a unity. And right. here, it isn't really. You still have at least 
two, I, more I, so, I at least are, two yeah. uh, different sources. Yeah, the, the, the place where this and is most obvious, uh, <clears throat> and it's not obvious for much of it, but the place where this is most obvious is in the very first chapter, in Genesis 37, where as you're reading along, right, Joseph uh, is given the coat, and he has the dreams, and his brothers have many reasons to be mad at him, which is okay. And then they decide that they're going to throw him into a pit, and then it's this moment in the middle where Joseph is sold. Someone comes along and pulls him out of a pit and sells him to someone else, and they seem to take him somewhere else. There are Midianites and there are Ishmaelites, and the brothers see the Midianites passing by, and they say, let's sell it to them, but the Ishmaelites pull them out of a pit. Um, so there's, there's just too many things going on, and you can see in the yeah. history of interpretation as people try to wrestle with this, right? There's the standard rabbinic option, um, or the standard Jewish option expressed by Rashi was there were essentially five sales that happened in a row uh, right, right in this moment. It's a little mm -hmm. bit uh, uh, impossible. In fact, this is another one of those chapters, like the flood, that pulls apart into two beautiful stories, one in which Joseph is sold by his brothers, yeah. and one in which he's left in the pit, and some passing traders pull him out and sell him uh, once they get to Egypt. Yeah. And the resonance of this later on, when you read the Joseph story, is that some, at one point, Joseph is talking to the butler and the baker, and he says, um, he says, you know, because I was uh, stolen from the land of the, of the, of the Israelites, right? I was, I was stolen, which seems to reflect the being yeah, pulled out. Yeah. And, and later on, when he encounters his brothers, he says, don't feel bad that you sold me. <laughs> Right, so, you know, it may be difficult to find all of the delineations, but the fact that there are two sort of traditions, particularly about where, how Joseph ended up there, seems to play out across the... So what the, the implication of this is then that the connection between the patriarchs and the Exodus must have been made fairly early because it gets into at least two major strands whenever you date those, and they may be difficult enough to date, but at mm -hmm. least they're earlier than Deuteronomy, they're back, back sometime in the pre-exilic period. Uh, and then, you know, thinking about where all of this material came from, uh, I would figure that a lot of the patriarchal stories we've been talking about must have started out as folklore mm -hmm. and had a fairly long history of development before there were combined into the sources at all. Yeah. So you probably have material here that grew over hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. One of the oddities of a lot of the book of Genesis is that they never mention a king of Israel or a king of Judah. That may be arguably a promise of one in Genesis 49, mm -hmm. but that's as close as you're going to get. Right. And so that, that there is a kind of memory of a time before kings I mean, it's but, clear enough that there are enough narratives, especially yeah. in the book of Samuel, about the creation of kingship yeah. that we know that there was cultural memory of a, of a, a pre-monarchic period. Yeah. Um, in fact, which would have lasted much longer than the monarchic period itself did. Um, yeah. And as long as there is sort of native tradition and continuity of uh, native Canaanites slash Israelites, we should expect these stories to have a relatively long life and long development. And it's not impossible that some earlier and some later elements are mixed in with each other uh, in, as these yeah. stories grew over time. But, but to say that there's historical memory there, of course, doesn't necessarily mean that it's accurate memory. That's right. In fact, memory very seldom is accurate anyway. That's right. Now, that all said, that the uh, Joseph story is a rather nice piece of literature. It is. It's about as, about as well told, even though it is, even though it is combined of, of two or more yeah. uh, sources. They play very nicely together, which makes it very hard to disentangle them. And the story is really nicely done. It has a very consistent theme throughout and a consistent structure. Right? This story is, and Joseph expresses it at the end, right? when Joseph says to his brothers, right, it was, uh, don't be afraid because you sold me. Right? It was God intended for me to come here in front of you right, to preserve life. Yeah. And uh, you know, what I like about the story is it has a roller coaster quality. That whenever things seem to be looking good, that means they're going to turn bad. Yeah. So Joseph is flying high at the beginning, and that's what gets him into trouble with his brothers and gets him sold into Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, then, you know, when he's there, he rises in Pharaoh's court, and then that gets him into trouble with Pharaoh's wife. And that gets him thrown into prison, but it's when he's in prison then that he has the dreams that That's really right. causes him to rise. That's right. And in the end, 
He's instrumental in bringing all his brothers and their families down to Egypt. And he's playing, and the, and he's playing the same roller coaster game with his brothers, right? Yeah. He treats them badly. Then he says, oh, no, I, I believe you. And then he gives them a test. Yeah. And then he gives, them, he gives them gifts. But then, right, then they have to come back and they have to bring a brother. The, he keeps on doing this to them. Yeah. Um, so within the story, there's the way he treats his brothers. There's his experience as a whole. And I think it's fair to say that in the grand narrative of the Pentateuch, the Joseph story serves this function also, that uh, it looks uh, quite bad for Joseph that he is sold into Egypt, but then again, uh, it's good, right? This is how yeah. he saves his brothers. Yeah. But it's bad because they've all ended up now in Egypt, which is, and they're going to be enslaved. But it's good but, because this is how you have the Exodus. Which is, you know, how, how they become a nation uh, for, for real. So, you know, th there's a, a lot of interesting structural stuff going on here that I think makes Joseph such an interesting pivot uh, and uh, central, central point in the, in the shift. The idea of God working behind the scenes is just central to the Joseph story. God almost never yeah. appears. It's, this is another reason that it's often likened to a book like Esther, where God is yeah. effectively not and present. And it's so different from the way God was dealing with Abraham, mm -hmm. where he could come down and have an argument with him. Yeah. Uh, everybody, just, everybody in, yeah. in, in the Joseph story, Joseph mostly trusts that God is, will take care of things. And in the end, even when it doesn't look so good, yeah. it, it turns out that that's the case. Divine providence is, is always at work in the Joseph story. Now, there is one interlude in the Joseph story that seems to be a different story altogether. And that's the story of Judah and Tamar. Yeah. And that this, too, is a great story. Now, you, know, we, you can see how it's woven in. Mm -hmm. There are certain recognition, there's a theme of recognition, there are mm -hmm. literary links, but it's really quite a different story. But now, in this one, Judah, who is the ancestor of Judah, uh, you know, goes out to sheep shearing. First of all, you know, he has uh, not given his daughter-in-law a husband the way he was supposed to. She goes out and decides to take matters into her own hands. He goes along to the sheep shearing, and at the end of it, well, he sees a prostitute, and he sees, and great. <laughs> and there doesn't seem to be any great problem with that part no. of it. No, that's not uh, where the moral ambiguity lies. But the, the problem comes up when he discovers that his daughter-in-law is pregnant. Yeah. And he says, bring her out. Let her be burned. Right. But because, because she has acted like a prostitute. Because she's acted like right. a prostitute. Okay for him to visit a prostitute, yep. not okay for his daughter-in-law to be one. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, she, present, she presents him with the staff and the cord that he gave her as a payment, right? yes, or as a, marker, as a marker for his payment. And she says, anyone recognize this? And he immediately says, right, she is more in the right than I am. Yep. Right? Which is a rather unusual thing uh, you know, in, in this sort of, in any ancient work, but particularly in the Bible, uh, you don't mm -hmm. often see uh, the patriarchal figure the, uh, the, or the male figure at all sort of giving that sort of uh, admission. Uh, admission. Is there any other case that you can think of in Genesis where, I mean, there are lots of cases where we think the patriarchs did something wrong, but is there any indication that either the patriarchs themselves or the author, you know, the authors of Genesis, thought they were doing anything wrong? Not uh, this clearly. Not this I mean, there are episodes yeah. like Reuben sleeping with his uh, father's maid. But Reuben is not so significant a character. That's true. Uh, this, yeah. this, it seems yeah. to me, is um, a place where, you know, it's, it's not even, this isn't, the patriarchs do things that are borderline immoral from our perspective. This is somewhat different. Uh, this isn't sort of passing off your wife as your sister. Uh, as Abraham and Isaac do, but uh, but this is the this is the one place where the patriarch says, "My mistake, my mistake," and there's reward for it. Right, Tamar and Judah are rewarded with what will be uh, ancestry of uh, King David. Yep, in the Catholic tradition, we call this the Felix culpa, mm -hmm. a happy <laughs> fault. <laughs> I suppose you could have said the same about Adam and Eve from one point of view, mm -hmm. that if they hadn't done what they did, we wouldn't have humanity as we know it. I don't think that's part think of that's the Catholic tradition. tradition. No, it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it isn't. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of the appeal of Genesis, I think, is that it shows you characters who aren't perfect, mm. 
uh, people who are, for that reason, sort of credible human beings. Yeah, and it will take, I think, well, and I think it will take until the Book of Samuel before we really meet credible human beings again. again. Moses doesn't count, and I don't think too many others do before we get to David. But Genesis is a, its appeal really lies in its yeah. true to life nature, right? P these people yeah. are people, and that yeah. makes it a, a pleasure to read over the generations.